but what a joyous time. Let's turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to be talking as we continue our series. We're going to be talking about uh, God's church. We're going to be talking about what it means to be a healthy church. And we've been in this series called um, uh, the... Um, yeah, what is it called? Good job, Rick. Um, living by the wind of the Spirit. You know, God, God wants his church, and that's you and I, to be led and guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible, as I've shared, uses a lot of illustrations about the church, the family, a body, and all that. But in church health, we actually, one of the things we use is a ship. And we've talked about these different parts. This is the totality of what a healthy ministry looks like, and it's about a sailing ship, and the ship trusts the wind of the Holy Spirit to move the ship. It's not powered by man. It's not powered by motor. It's powered by the power of the Holy Spirit. And folks, this is how God wants our lives to move. This is the one thing that is so different from the Old Testament to the New, is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose again, not only is he alive today, but when he left, he said, I will give you my spirit, and he will dwell in you, and he will work in you and through you. And the power of our submission to the Holy Spirit is what is evident in the health of individually and corporately as a body of faith. So what we've been talking about is, um, is the different parts of a healthy church. There are basically four, structural integrity, effective leadership, dynamic community, and essential resources. Now, we've been in instructional integrity. There are six parts of instructional integrity. There is biblical foundations, Streamlined structures, purposed and strategic direction, charting futures, navigating change, and today we're going to be on the sixth one, corporate prayer. And this is something that I think is most important, but something that is neglected. We've talked about the fact that the keel of the ship is your biblical foundation. That is the foundational piece that keeps the ballast of the ship right. It keeps it upright. When the storms come against the sails, it keeps that ship deep in the water. It is a very important part, as we talked about. Then we talked about streamlined structures. And we talked about the fact that these streamlined structures have to do with the gospel. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, growing to be like Christ. In other words, the truth is the gospel, the grace and mercy of the living God. That's what this is all about. And then to grow to be disciples of Christ. These are the things that everyone should see. It's the main structure of the ship. It's the main structure of who we are. We are to speak the truth in love. We are to grow to be like Christ. So that we are to be loving and we are to grow as disciples. Then thirdly is strategic direction. And we talked about the bowsprit, or the bowsprit, I'm sorry. And the bowsprit, and we'll talk about this, is also, see this rigging right here? If When they put a, a sail out on this bowsprit, there is a rigging that goes with that as well. And that rigging is what we're going to be talking about today. The, that is the extension, the, the trust, the, 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 the passion of the ship to move forward. And then there is the charting the futures and the navigating change. And we talked about that last week, that we talked about the fact that the power of the resurrection, we talked about charting futures, which is an act of faith, and we talked about listening and leaning in to the horizon of what God has for us as a church. Today, we're going to talk about the rigging of the ship, corporate prayer. If you notice, all of this is held together by the rigging. It is held together Corporate prayer is the rigging of the church. It is what holds everything in place. It holds the expanse. It's the expanse that partners with the wind of the Holy Spirit. As the wind hits those sails, if that rigging is not tight, if that rigging is not healthy in place, every one of those sails will break off and they will fall. It is the essence of the strength of the structure of the ship. And I want you to, uh, you know, without it, the masts fall and break. It's the key to structural integrity of the entire movement of the ship. Yet it's what we tend to focus the least on in the church. I want you to think about this. The things that hold the sails together is not church programs. 
It's not church traditions. It's not uh, denominations. It's not routines. It's not personalities. And I've got news for you. It's not even pastors. In fact, it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that Paul actually looked at the church in Corinth and said, what, would you stop? He said, you're, some of you are saying, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas. And then he goes on to say simply this, aren't we all but simply servants of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? That is what this is about. And so often we get so hung up on a pastor or a program or a tradition or something or buildings or whatever. Folks, that's not the rigging of the ship. The rigging of the ship is the passionate and intentional community of corporate prayer. Faith is forged in community. I, I want you to really hear that. This idea that, well, my faith is private is not biblical. I'm just going to share that with you. It's not. My faith is a private thing. No, it's not. And as I'm going to prove that to you this morning. God has told us that we are to be a community of faith. Yes, our decision before Christ is an individual thing, but it affects every one of us. And we affect each other. The strength that holds the mast of the ship upright and ready for the wind of the spirit le Spirit's leading is prayer itself. You see, corporate prayer is the most important part of a healthy church, along with worship, sound doctrine, communion, and fellowship. In the early church, the church met regularly to learn what the apostles taught, break bread, and what did it say? Pray together. Acts 2.42, it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, sharing in meals, which is the Lord's Supper as well, and to prayer. Prayer. I, I want you to think about something for a minute. What was prayer like in the Old Testament? I'm all on that one for just a second. Was prayer personal between the individual and God in the Old Testament, typically? It was some, but not typically. Typically, what did they do? They went to the temple, right? They relied on the priest to intercede for them. They did a lot of interaction, but let me tell you something. When the Spirit of God moved into the heart of these new believers, it became part of the fiber of who they were. It became part of what they were about. The Spirit of God in them changed everything. Everything. And they began to relate to God and to one another in a much more personal way. Faith wasn't centered on the temple. It wasn't centered on the priest. It wasn't centered on the, uh, the forms and the law. It was centered on community. It was centered on one another. It was centered on leaning upon the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John were released from prison, the whole church prays for boldness to continue preaching Jesus in the face of adversity. We're told that in the final amen to the prayer meeting, by the way, of the group, that in that place, it was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Do you know why we're not speaking the word of God boldness in our community? Because we're not praying. You know why we're afraid to share the gospel? We're not praying. You know we're, we're, why we're afraid to address the things in our home? Because we're not praying in our homes. We're not praying individually. And the problem is, is that we are relying upon ourselves. We are not relying upon the Lord himself. Acts chapter 6 the church faces a dilemma. The Grecian widows are being shortchanged in the food and the daily food distribution. And in, in, in spiritual wisdom, the 12 apostles call the entire church together. And this ministry of service, they say, is important, but it should not fall upon us as involved in the ministry of teaching the word and the ministry of 
What is it? I can't hear you. The ministry of prayer. Now, we, we, we talk about the teaching of the word, but why don't we talk just as equally about prayer? And then it says in the text, it says, decide among yourselves. That's what the apostle said. Decide among yourselves, presumably through prayer, who should head up this ministry of food service. This is the first set of deacons were put in place in the word of God. Prayer is not an afterthought in the early church. It was a ministry, a way to serve, a ministry of such high priority that it's the primary responsibility of those who walked with Jesus. But it was also done by the whole church. Amen? In fact, in every instance of prayer leading up to Acts chapter 6, the 12 are always leading others in prayer. I can give you about half a dozen scriptures to prove that to you. Now, not one word is said about the personal prayers of the apostles. Not one word. Now, we assume they prayed, right? Amen? But, but the reality is not one word. The emphasis is on public, corporate prayer. The church prayed together often. It was a high priority in the power of the church. So where did the apostles learn this? You say, well, where did they learn this from? Well, from Jesus. Do you, do you realize that there are 37 verses in the Gospels in which Jesus either prays or references prayer? 33 of those 37 instances are addressed to a plural rather than singular attendance of prayer, audience of prayer. 33 times. Jesus is talking. In fact, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Now, if you want to get Texan on this, you could go y'all. But anyway, the yous in this text are all plural. Every one of them in the, in the, in the original language, they're all plural. It says, ask and it will be given to you all or in Texan, y'all, okay? Seek and y'all will find. Knock and the door will be open to y'all. So if you want to be Texan about it, okay? The point is, all of the texts are plural. It's plurality. It's speaking of an audience. And so, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions about prayer. And, and this is where people get into, they some reason, there are people who say, well, well, you know, if, if we all pray together, then there's more power. There's no evidence of that in Scripture. Individual prayers are just as powerful and moving to the heart of God. Amen? You know, biblical prayers are multifaceted, encompassing the whole of the desire to enter conscious and intimate communion with our holy, perfect, and righteous God. Prayer is cooperating with God to bring about his plan and not trying to bend God to our will. As we abandon our own desires in submission to the one who knows our circumstances far better than we could, and he knows what we need for before we even ask, Matthew 6, 8. Our prayers reach the highest level. Prayers offered in submission to the divine will, therefore are always answered positively, whether offered in person or by a thousand. This idea that there's more prayer or more power in group prayer is largely comes into the church from a misinterpretation of a text. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20 it says, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with them. Is that a text about prayer, yes or no? No, it's not. It's a text about disciplining an erring brother or sister. It's saying that when two or three come together in agreement over an issue of sin in the body of faith. It's talking about the group. And it says, you come together as a group 
God is saying that I will sanction the decision of that group. Does everybody hear that? That is not a verse about, well, where two or three are gathered praying. That, that verse has been misinterpreted so many times. There, Jesus is present when two or three pray, but he's equally present when one believer prays alone. Even if that person is separated from others by thousands of miles. God intends for his people to pray together and to pray for each other. It is a priority. Amen? So church, let's talk for a minute. What are some truths about corporate prayer? Okay, I want to share some things with you. You might want to write these down. Number one. Prayer is one of the great equalizers in the fellowship of the church. All can come to the throne of grace. Amen? No matter our gender, our age, our race, our background, our experience, our social status, our makeup, our problems or no problems, our brokenness or our joyfulness, it doesn't matter. We all can find ourselves in the same place before the throne of God. It is the equalizer. Well, well, elders have a greater connection to God than the people. No, they don't. No, no. The power of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in every believer, folks. Amen? And when we get on our knees before the Lord, we find ourselves equal before the Almighty. Every one of us are needy. Every one of us are people that are broken. Every one of us are people who dearly, dearly, and desperately need the mercy of God. Hebrews 14, 6 says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, remember the resurrection? He's alive, folks. And because he's in heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of, of ours understands our weaknesses. He knows everything you face. And for he faced all the same testings and trials we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Then we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. Every one of us are needy before a savior. There should never be a judgmental bone in the body of Christ. We are to be a people that are, have ourselves on our knees before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it is the great equalizer in our lives. Not one of us are better than the other before the king. None of us. Secondly, corporate prayer greatly unifies us as we share a common faith. You know, I find it interesting that the church today seems more divided than ever. Especially here in the United States. We have been divisive of our politics, our racial racial prejudices that are ravishing the church, mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine, all the things that don't matter. We are children of the living God. We are citizens of another kingdom. We need to live in this world because we are not of this world. And the one place we should never be divided is in the body of Christ. Oh, how we get away from the heart of the Savior. Prayer is communing and conversing with God. And as we converse with God, as we yield our hearts to him, he brings us and he brings our will into perfect alignment to his heart. As we pray together, our hearts are more neatly knit together to God's heart and in turn are knit together to each other. Amen. 
We are given a glimpse of the unity that we will enjoy in heaven when we pray together. Amen? Oh, how we want to judge. How we want to posture ourselves is better than others. The foolishness of man's heart. Every one of us in this room are tempted that way. Every one of us. My hair's nicer than yours. Amen? <laughs> You see the point? I've got it figured out and you don't. How foolish we are. We are on a fool's errand spiritually when we don't put our knees before the king of kings and we don't understand just how desperately he wants his body unified. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed, Father, make them one as we are one. How, how do we insult the Trinity of God when we get ourselves divided? Folks, we need to pray because at the foot of the cross, we bring ourselves into a place of unity. Corporate prayer connects us around a common person, a purpose, seeking the heart of God and the heart of, uh, the heart of his purposes. As we seek him together, there is solidarity. We're not all pulling in our own directions. Our prayers become less selfish, and we're focused on God's will, God's purposes for our lives, and God's will in the lives of others. As we pray as a unified group with one heart and one mouth, we glorify the Lord Jesus in a way that is unparalleled in anything else in this world. Romans 15, 6 says, Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same Holy Spirit who dwells within each believer causes our hearts to rejoice as we hear praises to our Lord and Savior, knitting us together in a unique bond of fellowship that frankly, folks, is found nowhere else in this world. Nowhere else in life. And when we don't pray together, when we don't corporately come together and encourage and pray and strengthen one another, we are missing out on one of the key components of our faith formation that God desires for us individually and as a body of faith. Amen, church? Here's another one. Corporate prayer edifies and encourages those who participate as we lift up the needs of one another. You know, when we gather together to pray and we seek the heart of God, individual hearts are encouraged. You know, I, I don't know about you, but life is hard. And I don't know about you, but my difficulties are many. And, there, and that's not unique to believer or unbeliever. Individuals within the group may be struggling with trials, too personal to mention, but as they pray in unity with other believers, their hearts are refocused on the hope of God Almighty. Amen? Gets our eyes off of here and gets our eyes on him. Their faith is strengthened by remembering his grace and his goodness. The Holy Spirit brings them reassurance and comfort through the prayers of others. This is why the wise writer of Hebrews remind us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen? Hebrews 10.25. See, sadly, we have delineated that, that verse to a show up to church and count ears and noses. You know, you need to know that the ushers like, you know, like Larry, they count noses. Pastors count ears to make themselves look good. So anyway, the, <laughs> I'm just teasing. The point is, that's not what that verse is about. It's not about just showing up. It's about being in communion before God with one another. Having koinia. The word fellowship is koinia. It's much more than food, I got news for you. It's about intimacy together before the living Savior. 
As we pray together, our hearts are open towards the needs of others. During prayer times together, and I've had this happen, the Holy Spirit will often speak to a person's heart, showing them how they can specifically encourage the need of someone else they're praying with. And I got news for you, nothing was ever mentioned in the prayer. Something the Holy Spirit does. In this way, we live out the instructions of the Apostle Paul, where in Galatians 1 6, where he says that we are to bear one another's burdens. Amen? Folks, this is why we're in the church. This is why the church is so important. It also builds us. It, 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 it also builds us in love and concern for others as we intercede for them. To those who may be alone and struggling with life's burdens, hearing others lift them up in the throne of grace can be a great encouragement. You know, I, I travel and I, I teach overseas, and I will never forget this one time I was praying with a group, and I asked the gentleman, I said, what is her name? And he told me. And so as we prayed, I lifted her name before the Lord. And she began to weep and weep and weep and weep. And I looked at the man afterward. I said, did I say something wrong? He said, no, pastor. He said, this woman has never heard anyone lift their name to the Almighty. Do you know, it, it changed me because no matter where I go now, believer, unbeliever, I don't even care. I want to know the name. And I will lift that name before the Almighty. It taught me something that day. The words are precious. And words are valuable. And, and, and lift up that name. Folks, that's what God wants for us as a body. To lift up one another. Lift the name before the Lord. Corporate prayer is also strengthens new disciples. Think about it. How many of us remember those days where we're going, I don't know how to pray. Don't ask me, man. Don't you dare call on me. I don't know what to do. I'm gonna... Can I just hide in a corner? I don't want to. You remember those days? I do. And I remember sitting, and, and you know, it, it didn't take very much in a, in a group prayer where I picked out the haughty and the arrogant. I picked out the selfish and the foolish. And I picked out the one who truly grabbed hold of the throne of God. There was a gentleman by the name of Tony who would come to Tucson, or to Yuma, excuse me. He was a winter visitor, and he would come to Tucson, or I keep saying Tucson, come to Yuma. And I would, I would, I would long for him to come. He was a brother from Canada. He was from Russia. And, and the first time I met him, we talked, we fellowshiped, but then we, we knelt down on our knees in my office, and we began to just pray together. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but for me, this was life-changing for me. As I sat there and I listened to my brother pray, I began to weep because I felt like I was in the presence of godliness. I felt like I was in the presence of one who had the heart of God in the palm of his hand. And as he prayed, and as he prayed over me, and as he prayed over the church, and as he prayed over his brothers, and, and as he lifted and exalted the Lord with his heart, I just longed, and, and I'm going to tell you, I just longed every winter for him to come. I wanted to pray with him. I wanted to be near him. I wanted to, and, and I, I, would, I would pray, God, I would love to commune with you like that. But I learned volumes. And my point is this. When we pray together, and we pray in the true sense of the way God desires of humility, there is a massive amount of teaching that goes to the heart of those around you. And trust me, you can teach well or you can teach poorly, but people are smart. 
they know what pride looks like. They know what arrogance looks like. They know what humility looks like. And they know what a contrite heart looks like. And my prayer is, as a church, as brothers and sisters, that, that we will encourage those who are new disciples. We would, and what about those who are weak in the faith? When we pray together, there are those who are weak in the faith and struggling and doubting and, and discouraged. And, and when we pray together and we truly are unto the Lord, it's not about us, it's unto the Lord. There's a strengthening of faith that occurs in our brothers, folks. How about this? Corporate prayer is a great expression of our dependence upon God together. Amen? We are notably way too independent souls. When we pray together, it reflects the heart of individuals who participate. You say, well, what does dependence look like? What does that look like? Well, our dependency comes to God in humility. It's not about me. It's about him. I'm not trying to put a show on for anyone else. It's about him. It's all about him. Humility, humble yourselves, therefore, unto the Lord, and he will lift you up, James 4.10. Dependency means that we come to God dependently. God, I, I can't do this without you. I can't live this faith journey without you. You know, sadly, we, we have learned how to follow rules. We've learned how to count the, check the boxes that make everyone around us look like we know we're spiritual and that we somehow are godly. And, you know, I, I just find it amazing that somehow that we disrespect the cross in such a way like that to, to think that somehow we're faking anybody. Folks, God knows our hearts. He knows who we are. And, and we need to, when we pray together, we need to pray dependently. Isaiah says this, for I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 16, 9, in their hearts, humans can plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Amen. We are dependent upon him. Psalm 121, 1 and 2, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the hills. Where does my help come from? And the answer is my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Or how about Psalm 23, one that everybody knows, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Corporate prayer is a great expression of our dependency upon God as a church and as individuals. Our dependency is also expressed when we come to God in our brokenness. Folks, I, I work with a lot of churches and a lot of Christians. And I'm, I'm just confessing to you that even in my own life, I have to work at coming to God broken because the pride of my heart is so big. Maybe I'm only speaking to myself this morning to work at it. Seeking a broken heart, dwelling in his mercies in my life. I've, I've shared with you many, many times that I have to remind myself of what God has taken me from, the sinful man that I am, the brokenness that I am. And every morning I need to remind myself so that I can brokenly come to God. And so, so prideful is the church in America. The rigging is broken 
in the American church. We are so full of ourselves from the leadership all the way into the congregation. And we can't figure out why the power of God doesn't exist on the church. We can't figure out why the glory of God is not working through the church. We can't figure out why our communities don't see the church as an alternative to the problems of their life. And we don't figure out why the people who are so desperately need the Savior can't see the Savior. Is it possible that it's because of me? Is it possible? You see, the kingdom of God is a paradox. Listen closely. The kingdom of God is a paradox. And when you and I become children of the kingdom of God, we enter this paradox. Strength only comes through weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and the hardships and the persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For then when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a paradox. The kingdom of God, the paradox of the kingdom is that greatness is through service. Mark 10, 43 says, but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Jesus didn't leave any room for this. You're the greatest servant. Or how about wholeness comes through brokenness? Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and he bandages their wounds. There's a classic prayer that says this, let me learn by paradox, O Lord, that the way down is the way up, that the way low is to be high, uh, uh, that the way to be low is to be high, uh, is not to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, and that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit. The wisdom of God is that no saint is high, healed, and rejoicing that has not also low, broken, and contrite. Samuel Rutherford bluntly said it this way, seek a broken heart for your sin, for without that there is no meeting with Jesus Christ, end quote. We may achieve much in this world without a broken heart. We may even seem to achieve much in the Christian life without a broken heart. We, but we cannot commune deeply and sweetly with the Savior, for he enters only through the cracks of a broken heart. Brokenness cannot justify us. Tears cannot cleanse us. Only the blood of Jesus can. Amen? He is so rich. Ephesians 1, 7. He is so rich in his kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. Yet the point still holds. A broken heart over our sin opens the door for a deeper communion with Christ. Psalm 51, David cries out to God over his sin, and he says this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You know, if David was going to enjoy restored communion with God, he knew he didn't need a 12-step program. He didn't need willpower. He needed a broken heart. Read the text. He knew that the only way to healing was a brokenness. Some of us vainly attempt to climb the ladder to heaven by our good deeds and by our feelings. But the brokenhearted know that we reach heaven only by bended knees. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, the word of God says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. 
Isaiah 57. The grace of the Holy One comes only to lowly ones. Our dependency is shown also when we come to him in thanksgiving. Philippians 4 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. We dependently show that we come to God through our confidence in him and we come boldly to his throne. One other thing, actually two other things. Corporate prayer can facilitate corporate repentance. Church, I want you to hear this. We, we, we don't talk about repentance enough anymore. And we want to say that it's a private thing, it's my sin. And, but I'm going to tell you something. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel all modeled repentance as part of corporate prayer. I can give you the verses. Ezra 7.10, Nehemiah 9.2, Daniel 9.11. It, it was all about corporate prayer and the repentance of the people. As we stand together united in prayer in the Holy Spirit, we can bring an awakening in our hearts to our need to confess our sin. In humility, we begin to recognize and renounce our sin as disobedience to a holy God. Folks, we are masters at posturing. We are masters at defending ourselves, justifying our sin, and justifying our disobedience. I'm the head of the pack. And I need to be reminded by my brothers and sisters that we have got to repent and call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. No sin is committed in isolation. No sin. All wrongdoing affects others within the body of Christ. And when we engage in corporate confession, each of us as individuals are cleansed and forgiven for our sins. And there is a fresh awakening to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I got news for you. You want revival to be unleashed? This is how it happens. You know, folks, we look at our culture and the divisiveness and the polarization of different groups. The call to corporate confession has perhaps never been more needed. As we come together and we confess our sins and the temptation to judge each other will lessen and disappear. Instead, we, we, we will we'll realize we are all sinners in desperate need of the mercy and grace of our God. As we receive his grace and his fresh awakening to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, great things will result. And the last thing that I believe is so powerful for corporate prayer is that prayer together creates a sense of expectancy of what God will do next. What is God up to? What is he about? What does he want? I wish all of us had some gold tablets and we were so smart, we would have all of God's, well, you gotta do this, do this. We don't have that. We have the word of God to give us guidance and wisdom, but this isn't everything about our God. And when we chart through life and we have to make those little detours and those little changes, we need to rely upon the prayer and the power of the Spirit to navigate through all that God has in this world. Expectancy is a biblical concept. In Psalm 5.3, David wrote, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait expectantly. Oh, what would happen to our times of prayer as believers if we not only met together corporately and, and we prayed, and we, but we began to anticipate, what is God doing? What does he desire? 
What does he long for? And God begins to unify the church and begin to unify the heart. And there is one mind of praise and there is one mind of prayer and there's one heart that is rejoicing to God, our Savior. And we're saying, God, who, who and what do you desire us to be and do? And with one voice, we become a force for the power of the living God in this day. Instead of reading about it in Acts 2 or Acts 3 or Acts 4, we start going, maybe today, God. And we become the Acts 29 church. People all of a sudden become excited to have a prayer meeting. They become expected to see God show up and answer prayer. We witness God answering prayers of others and their sense of hope builds and they wait for the expectancy of God to answer their own requests. A unified biblical mindset of faith begins to develop. We need this mindset now more than ever before. Many of lost a sense of hope, even in the church. I know pastors who are getting out of the ministry because they've lost hope in the church. They've lost hope in God's people because all we care about is our, our little gripe sessions. Is it possible that hope can be rekindled as we gather in groups, both small and large, to corporately pray and seek the face of our God. I still believe. Do you? Let's not forget how important it is to gather for times of corporate prayer. Whether in cell groups or large groups or massive prayer meetings, as we seek the face of our God, because I promise you, we will see unity grow. We will see experience and encouragement firsthand. We will strengthen our collective faith. We will facilitate repentance and create a sense of expectant hope of what God is going to do. Because that's my prayer for this church. I am just the servant of God to you. Are you listening? Romans 15.3 is my blessed prayer for you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, corporate prayer is one of the beauties of his church. In the days ahead, you're going to hear about prayer nights. In the days ahead, you're going to hear about a 40 days of prayer where we as a church will commune together to pray for 40 days. But I want you to know something that's going on that I want to challenge every one of you to be a part of. 9.30 every Sunday morning, right here in the back of this worship center, there are a group of people who seek the heart of God passionately I'm going to tell you, I just as soon shut down all the Bible studies and have a prayer meeting. I'm just telling you. Because I'm going to ask you one simple question. What you learned last week, what of it did you put in practice this week? Because if you didn't put it in practice, then Bible study is a waste. I'm just being honest. When are we going to understand that God wants us to live Love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. He wants us to live out a faith journey today. Our faith grows by the word of God. The word of God is powerfully important. Do not misunderstand. But if it is not the seedbed, for faith and the seedbed for hope and the seedbed for trust and the seedbed for an adventure to follow the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are wasting our time. I know people that are in five different Bible studies a week and their life is the same as it was 10 years ago. 
God, forgive us. I'm afraid that there are going to be some judgments before the Lord that we're not going to be thrilled about. So, child of God, I want to challenge you today. Begin to pray personally. You say, well, I don't know how, Pastor. Just talk to him. Just talk to him like you talk to me. There's nobody that loves you more than he does. There's nobody that will love you more through your stumbling than he will. There is no one that will embrace your heart and your cries and your worries and your fears more than he will. Well, pastor, I don't want to look foolish in front of somebody else. Well, I got news for you. Look foolish because the grace and the glory of God will be overpoured upon you, not only by God, but by God's people. It's the person who thinks they can pray with it all together that everybody looks at and goes, ah, that's not good. Folks, we need to lay ourselves before him. And we need to lay ourselves before him about this community who so desperately need the Savior. I don't know if you're here or you're online today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. But I want you to know this. I know unbelievers who pray more than believers sometimes. If you're here and you don't know Christ, I want to share something with you. The prayers of an unbeliever are much like that of a schoolyard. This is kind of how I illustrate it. I want you to imagine the whole world praying, crying out to God, because there's a lot of people who don't know God who are crying out to him. But I want you to imagine it like a schoolyard, because it's noise. Have you ever walked up to a schoolyard and stood outside the fence and listened to a thousand kids screaming and yelling and hollering and all that? Every, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. It's noise. But I guarantee you, how many of you in here are mothers? I guarantee you, if your child is out in the middle of that schoolyard and your child screams, Mom, let me ask you a question. Do you pick out their voice, yes or no? Oh, you bet. You bet. Even though it's noise to everybody else, when your child screams, it's not noise. Well, I got news for you. That's how I believe scripturally that God sees the world. The world is crying out. You may not hear it. You may not know that unbelievers are crying out to God, wanting answers, wanting to know, wanting solutions. Their hearts are messed up. Their lives are messed up. They're struggling with their marriages, their finances, and every part of their life. And they're just saying, God, when are you going to show up? And God's saying, Zach, are you going to show up for me? Mary, are you going to show up for me? Because they're crying and I need you to show up for me. Yes. And I need you to pray over them. Yes. Because even though I don't hear their voice, I will hear yours. You are my child. And I will hear your voice. And you lift him up before the Lord. I will hear your voice for them. So if you're here and you don't know Christ, I know your heart is crying. I want you to know that we here love you. That God loves you even more than we do. And if you want someone to pray over you, understand your pain, understand your hurt, you can come here. We will lift you up before our Savior. But there is a place for you at the, at the foot of the cross. And we would love to share our Savior with you. And it said, the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. You receive Christ. You invite him into your life. And he, he, will, he will take the blood of the cross and apply it to your life. And you will be his child. And he will come into your life and change your life. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes. There's room at the cross for you. So if you need Christ, come and see us afterward. Come up here. I was going to have us break into groups for prayer. You know what? We're just going to do it.
we have a, a meeting here. We'll take, we're going to take about 10 minutes. And we'll have the meeting. In the meantime, I'm going to ask, Bob, would you lead this group right here? You guys gather together and just pray. Um, uh, Zach, would you gather this front half? Brother back here, would you gather the back half? Would you mind? I, I, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. I can't remember your name. Um, would you mind? Okay. Gather this group. Um, Brian, would you gather the back group back there and pray? Grady, would you gather this front group and pray? Kelly, would you gather the front group? Uh, in fact, just gather this whole group and just pray. Amen? All right. Um, um, uh, what did you, uh, Darren. <laughs> Darren, would you gather this front group and just pray? And, and, uh, and Brian, uh, Byron, would you gather this back group and just pray? Just get in a circle and pray. And you guys along the back wall, would you just get together in a group and pray? And I know the children are coming in. Have them pray with you. They need to hear you pray. And would this whole group just gather together and one of you brothers or sisters just lead the group? Would you mind, brother? Would you just lead the group and just pray? Can we do that right now? Amen? And if you need to know Jesus, would you come see us? Come see me, okay? Father, today we confess that we are a needy people. And God, we desperately need you. As your children, as your church, God, we declare this is your church and we are your people. And God, we ask for your will and your wisdom, your direction. We ask, Father, for your glory in the church. We ask, Father, that you would unify us. You would bring glory and unity to all that we are about. And God, help us to lift you high. And may, Father, we be a people who are totally dependent upon you. God, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And you, are, Father, are the one who so desperately desires for your glory through the church. I pray, Father, for all of us that we would lean and submit our hearts to you. God, we would be a people that would lean upon one another. And together, Father, we lift up your heart, your purposes, your glory in and through your church. 
God, I don't know all the needs that are going on in the hearts of your people, but you do. And I pray that those hearts that are discouraged, those hearts that are doubting, those hearts that are disillusioned, that God, you would just unite us as one and unite us together and encourage them to turn their eyes upon you. Father, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And I pray that God, that this church would be a mighty force of your power by your spirit in this community. And God, may you start a work today that is far beyond any of us would ever imagine for your glory and your praise. And all God's people said, amen, amen.